<laughs> I'm late. Ugh, yeah, I'm late. Man, I was bumping. I'm running all over the place trying to figure out what I'm doing. And I lost my glasses. <laughs> I lost my glasses. How am I supposed to read any of this? Ugh. Come on! This is ridiculous. <laughs> How do you expect your boy to do a good job if I don't have my glasses? Well, I figured it out. I know what I got to do. I gotta wear the Chanel's. <laughs> I gotta wear the Chanel's. Oh, my wife got them for me. My mega hot half Korean beauty queen wife also known as Lovesick Me over at Telegram. She's not here today, big bummer actually. I'm truly heartbroken in fact. You know, she's like, um, she's like my power glove, right? She's my power glove. She's my extra, she's my extra guys on Contra. She's my up, up, down, down, left, right. Left, right, BA, start. <laughs> or did I put too many left, rights in there? <sighs> no matter what. She's got Wolf, she's got Lucian, she's got my heart, but you, you've got my time right here on Paleocrat Diaries. Ow! I want to see those wolves in the live chat because we're going to show that live chat. And if you're over right now, if you're on Paleocrat Diaries Wolfpack chat on Telegram, get it bumping because we're going to show it. We're going to show it. Oh, by the way, a big apology to the gaggle of folks out there who say, I don't really like Jeremiah's energy. <laughs> I don't like how he's so excited about life, how he's so pumped up about the Lord and stuff. He should be way more somber, way more serious. I don't think so. I don't think so. I gotta be me. I'm the kind of me that is drinking, by the way, Tridentine Brewing Company, Tridentine Brewing Company, at 10 in the morning. <laughs> 10 in the morning. Are you sad a little bit that that music stopped? Mm. Catherine said, how many cups of coffee? Not even two. And I drink half-calf. <laughs> I'm just like this 24-7. Actually, to be honest, anyone who knows, anyone who's involved with the Wolfpack chat over on Telegram, anybody who's involved with that, they will be able to tell you if they've tuned in to any of the live chats, if they've tuned in to any of the prayer meetings that we do. I've been doing them basically every night. Granted, it's so late at night, it's basically morning, <laughs> right? So I've been I've been up at like, you know, uh, midnight, 1230, doing prayers with people. We're going through, here, let me get it out right now. We're going through uh, the the preparation stages for this right here, right? So if you're down with that, if you're in the preparation stages, that's something you want to do and you want to join other people who are praying the prayers and who are um, uh, reading the various suggested readings from this. We've been reading, of course, out of the gospel. Uh, we've been reading out of St. Matthew. And it's cool because there are people in the chat. You know, I want to give a big a big shout out right now to Phil. Uh, Phil over in the chat, he's been helping a lot. So is, J so is Jake Fowler. They've been helping a lot over there and... So like I'll do I'll do the opening prayer and introduce everything. They'll do a reading from the gospel. They'll do extra prayers, and then we do the prayer requests for the intentions of the wolf pack because we have a, a prayer channel over there. And so if you're part of that, you can just submit your your prayer requests right there. We forward them to the prayer channel. It's the wolf pack prayer chain. You go ahead and you put it over there, and bada boom, bada bing, uh, we're praying about it at night. We take it seriously. You know, we're not we're not doing that whole you know, hey man, thoughts and prayers. We're not doing that. We're actually praying for you. We are, we are mentioning your intentions um, aloud. We are raising them up to the Lord. That's what we're doing over there. And so if that's something you're down with, <laughs> should I take these things off? Should I? Oh, yeah, there we go. That's, there I am. <laughs> there I am. I did feel pretty cool in that. I might, I might put them back on in, the, in that time where we move on to uh, the, the main stage. We're going to be talking today, of course, about uh, burning books, quote unquote. And I don't want people to just immediately be like, dude, is he going to go outside and burn some books? Maybe. I might go do that. <laughs> but that's not that's not what that's about. But we're reading, as I said, over there, anybody who's seen me over there and they've seen me doing the prayers, they've had conversations, because I'll stick around. Last night, what was it? Is anybody in the chat who was there last night? It was only a handful of us. But I was in there till probably, what, 2.30 in the morning? 
So three in the morning, was it? Something, it was insane. It was dumb <laughs> for me to stay in there so long, right? That, that was maybe a little bit unnecessary, okay? I didn't need to do that. But it was awesome to just talk with people. And, and if, you, if you get to know me over there, you'll be like, okay, so when the music comes on and the music's bumping and everything's going crazy, the guy's a wild child, right? The guy's off his rocker. He's completely out of his head. And it's true. It's true. I am a little crazy, actually, about it. But the, uh, the thing is, is that they get to see me just chilling, you know, just as I am, not even, not even with this setup, okay? This is, this is the studio camera stuff. It's just casual. It's my cruddy mic that I got to use and stuff. It's all that. It's like, it's just, it's just everyday life. And so if you want to connect with us over there, you want to be involved in the book club. And the book club, by the way, is going through this right here. Okay, we had our first meeting and everything, by the way, the prayer meetings that we do and the book club meetings and any of the pizza party we did, all that stuff, that's all available over at the chat. It's available on video so you can watch it. You can download it. You can download the MP3. You can just listen to the audio while you're driving, pray along in the car, do all that stuff. We've made all of that available because the community of people that are involved in the Wolf Pack. It's just true. We have, we have, in my opinion, we have the best community in the stratosphere. The best one. The best one. It's the most, it, it, it's so, it's so spread out in a, in a way that is still like, uh, you know, what have I called it? The Megazord. The Megazord, right? It's not just a comment section. It's a place where people are making friends, where people are praying with each other, where people are learning about the faith, where people are throwing out prayer requests for their family and their friends. People who are dying. People who've been diagnosed with cancer. Relatives who have walked away from the faith and are on their deathbed. That's the kind of stuff we're doing over there. And you're not stuck in a chat. You're not stuck just hoping that maybe somebody's going to see what you wrote and maybe possibly somebody's going to reply to you. No, 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 no. That's not how we roll, is it? That's not how we roll. Yeah, in the comments, okay, Haley in the comments. I may as well just pop up these comments right now. Well, hold on, I'm gonna, I, I have that in the next screen. Uh, first of all, I've been talking about it. So I may as well just show you right now, okay? Check this out. This right here, just real fast. This is Paleocrat Diaries. We got right there. Right now, I'm drinking the uh, Jasmine Spring, right? I don't know how you would pronounce that. Is it, is it uh, Wansu? How would you pronounce that? G-U-A-N. Is it uh, G-Z-H-O-U? Is, is that how it's spelled? G-U-A-N, G-Z-H-O-U, yeah. I don't know how you'd pronounce that in Chinese. Inspired by spring while enjoying American beer in that city in China, a rooftop beer garden. The dream is now a reality. Yeah. So, but yeah, the, the, the fine folks over there. In fact, we, we will definitely be setting up any, uh, an event in January. That's the plan. That's the plan. I'm going to bring my camera. going to bring the lighting. I'm even going to bring the makeup, going to have, going to have love sick, going to have her put the makeup on, on the boys. <laughs> They're going to have to suck it up. You got, you got lights, you got cameras, you got to get that action. It's just true. All right, yeah, Eric, Yab by the way, check this out. You guys know Eric Yabara? <laughs> you should. You should because he is the man. He's the man. And here's the thing. So he sends me this picture. He sends me this, this picture of, an, I think it's a 1977 edition of Ronald Knox. Okay, it's Ronald Knox's book, Enthusiasm. We did a 20-part series on that. And he goes, hey, is this the book you recommended once? <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you talking about? What? <laughs> did I recommend it once? <laughs> I did a 20-part series, man. 20 videos long. You know what? You're busted, dude. <laughs> you outed yourself, Eric Yabara. You outed yourself, man. Because you know what that shows? It shows that you are not watching your boy. It shows that you are not hooked, man. <laughs> if, you, if you were watching it, you'd be like, I'm part of the Big Yellow Book Club. Except, except, mine's blue. You would have said it. But no. But you know what? He remembered. And apparently we talked about it a couple years ago. Right? And so he sent, he sent it to me. He sent me some pictures on the inside. So I, I told him. I had to tell him. I said, hey, look, man. We've actually done a bunch of videos, and when I explained it, he's like, you serious about that? <laughs> yes, I'm dead serious. I ain't lying. I ain't lying to you. Oh, yeah, man, I did, I did 20 episodes. Where are they? Uh, <laughs> of course I did them. Of course. 
And they're awesome. In fact, the most defining mark probably of Paleocrat Diaries history. So now at this point, people, when they see the word enthusiasm, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where they see it. You know, you could have curb your enthusiasm and they're like, Paleocrat. <laughs> it doesn't matter. That, that person's enthusiastic and they'd be like, yeah, I don't think they really know what that means. <laughs> and so the, the word is toast. It's done. It's over. In fact, it was funny. It was, uh, there's an example of this. Let's see if we can find it without going too far, too far all over the place. Okay, by the way, there's, there's one of the prayers. Oh, let me get back here. There. That's one of the prayers I'm talking about, the Wolfpack prayer right there. Jake Fowler. Jake Fowler just wrote a great article. We'll show, we'll show that in a second. People, of course, making the memes and all that stuff. All that stuff. Yeah. Trying to think. Oh, it, oh here it is. Here it is. Yeah. It's right here. Okay. Right here, you had uh, you had on there, oh my gosh, man. <sighs> on reason and theology. You know, you had an excellent, excellent conversation. I can't believe that at this moment, the, uh, Dr. Feingold. Yes. So, so um, Michael was talking to Dr. Feingold. And it was a great conversation. If you haven't heard, if you haven't seen him before, uh, he talks about like Hebraic Catholicism, stuff like that, a lot of Jewish roots type stuff of our faith. And Hector Molina said, Dr. Feingold's an absolute treasure, a brilliant theologian whose erudition is only surpassed by his boundless enthusiasm. And right away, <laughs> we put those emojis like, what? <laughs> yeah, we're book nerds. We're total geeks here, man. We are total nerds over here. And so anytime we see that word, Anytime we see it, all right, we get excited. People reminding us, of course, to pray for the holy souls in purgatory. Um, in fact, that's the new article by Jake Fowler. You can see that over at paleocratdiaries.com. It's uh, on death, dying, and the holy souls in purgatory. So you can see that. And I also wrote an article too, okay? I also wrote an article too. And in fact, we'll just show that real quick. So check this out, right? So over here, oh, sorry about that. There we go. There we go. It's all right. As you can see, this is uh, Paleocrat Diaries. Yep, on death, dying, and holy souls in purgatory. But I, I just wanted to just say something about this. And you got to go check this out. New contributor, Jake Fowler. Uh, you just added him also. Uh, added David uh, Holeva. So if you haven't seen either of their interviews on the show, you got to do it. They're brand new contributors. They're going to be writing at their, le at their leisure, right? So whenever they want, on whatever they want. That's, that's the rule. I love those guys for real. I believe they are shining stars in a dark, dark world. And I'm really, really honored to have them on board at Paleocrat Diaries. But right here, crying at church, or cry at church, laugh at lightning, howl at the sun. And it's one of these things, you know, it, goes, it just talks about where we got Paleocrat Diaries from. Why, why are we doing any of this, right? Why do we focus on the needs of common people? People I call the Johnny Q and Sally Sue. Why do we say take a knee for Jesus every day? Why the, why the idea of never give up and keep on smiling? Why the idea of momentum mori? I have a quote, in fact, from my daughter, right, where that came from, because I say momentum mori at the end of every show. And she said, Papa, I'm probably going to die, you know. But that's okay, because we're all going to die one day. And that's why I think people should dream bigger thoughts. By the way, that's also at the end of the show. Thinking about what they love to do, then deciding to do it the best they can. Even if they make mistakes, that's all right. It's normal. At least they can say they did what they love and they gave it their best the whole entire time. Why are we so authentic and real? Raw and real? You know, why, why, why the apologetics of the heart? Why, why talk when we say we're talking about po apologetics? Why are we going through Father Lassance's uh, manual for young men and young women? Why? There's a good reason for it. Why do we talk about the simplicity of the act of faith on the show? Why do I insist that I want to be a brother and not a leader? And why do we foster a house of laughter, learning, and prayer? I tell the story. And you should go check it out. <laughs> you should go check it out. All right. Speaking of checking it out, we're going to be moving along real fast here. We're going to move along real fast. Um, uh, actually, because this isn't actually on the next page. I just want to say hi real quick. I just want to say hi to the folks over here. They did a, they did a, a top 10. And I'll put this out there for everybody in the chat, right? Everybody in the chat, we're interested, okay? The, the random question, let's see if we have it up here. Let's see, do, 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 do. There we go. There's my answer, right? 10 people, dead or alive, from the past 100 years that you would like to invite to a dinner party, right? 
So they have to be within the last 100 years. There were a couple people that didn't make the mark. Okay. Mm. I was a little bit bummed about that. <laughs> I was a little bit bummed about that. And I put on there, here's my list. And I, I said, look, no particular order. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you, a, you know, kind of a hint as to how this works. So if you had a dinner party and you wanted to invite 10 people over to that, who would they be? We're very interested in your, in your thoughts about this. Make sure to comment over there. Right here, um, I put down Marsha McLuhan, Edith Hamilton. Okay, she's the one, who, uh, Marsha McLuhan, the media theorist, Catholic media theorist. Edith Hamilton uh, wrote a book on mythology, an excellent book. The Atheist Christopher Hitchens. And I put on there that I have a wide variety of reasons for doing this. And part of it, to be honest, would be the setting. Like, what would this be <laughs> if you had these folks, right? Th th this this uh, grouping of people in the exact same room. Um, yeah, so Edith Hamilton, Christopher Hitchens, Ronald Knox, Hunter S. Thompson, C.G. Jung, Neil Postman, Francis Parker Yaki, Chester Bellick, because they're conjoined. <laughs> they're like, they're, they're conjoined at the heart. Okay, G.K. Chesterton and Hilary Bach, they're conjoined at the heart. And, of course, Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> I say that as, of course, like, oh, everybody's like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, of course. <laughs> P.S., I invited Dorothy Day, but she was too busy doing saintly things for the down and out. Okay, so that's just the way that that went. Um, you know, I, I didn't even think to look up. I don't know why I didn't think to look this up. Um, uh, uh, St. Therese of Lisieux, what year did she die? That's a good question. Because we got photos. We have photos of some other, some other saints who died before the cutoff line. So again, you want to join this club? You want to join this group? You want to see all of the different members, connect with them, all the different media, like the prayer from last night right there that we prayed? You want to see all the PDFs, all the different documents that we share, all the different links, all the music, all the voice chats, and of course, all the cool GIFs that we share? and memes and all of that. To do that, you simply have to go to Paleo Crad Diaries Wolfpack Chat. And that's on Telegram, link in the description below. All right, we're gonna talk about the Saint Maker. You gotta go get it, gotta go check it out. We're gonna talk about that as soon as we come back. As soon as we come back, we are going to be deep diving into Father Lassant's and his classic manuals for, and guides, in fact, for young, and I put in parentheticals, and I know I, I'm confident that he would agree with me because they're lifelong companions. They're meant to be uh, manuals and guides for young men and women. And this is part three. If you missed part one and two on purity and apologetics. Uh, and the second one was um, apologetics, but I forget the second part of the name. If you guys remember in the chat, go ahead and let me know. But uh, we're going to get right to that. But first, we're going to talk about the Saint Maker. We're going to talk about this and how it can change your life. So right after that, we'll be right back with more Paleocrat Diaries right here on Meaning of Catholic, this is the Wednesday, November 10th edition of Paleocrat Diaries. Can a personal planner really make you a saint? Not by itself, but in our day and age of addictive apps and glowing screens, we're bombarded by constant distraction, and our quest for sainthood often takes a backseat. The Saint Maker is the first high-performance planner for the spiritual life, made by faithful Catholics for faithful Catholics. It's a work of genius, really, fusing the wisdom of the saints with the science of personal productivity. It's rigorous, but sainthood is tough, and most of us need help organizing our time, our work, our leisure, and our devotion, because that can help you become a saint. The Saint Maker is elegant, fits in your purse or briefcase, and is a perfect companion for your missal, Bible, or rosary. Published four times per year, each season includes daily planning pages, feast days, and devotions for both forms of the liturgical calendar, goal-setting pages, confession journals, and more. It's why the Saint Maker is used by hardworking Catholics like CEO of Sock Religious Scott Williams, best-selling author Sam Guzman, YouTubers like Amber Schneider, a Catholic wife Dina Barca, and Brian Holdsworth, and priests like Father Corey Stitcher. Try the Saint Maker out, and if you decide that it's not for you, you can send it back for a full refund within 90 days. So go right now. Find your life planner at thesaintmaker.com. Quantities are limited, though, so head on over to thesaintmaker.com to order yours and to start your Saint Maker journey today. All right, folks, you got to do it. Head on over right now, thesaintmaker.com slash paleocrat diaries. Oh. And there's that sound. That sound means that we are entering the octagon of history. 
We are going to tackle some of the most difficult and pressing questions in this secular age that we are enduring. This cesspool of secularism, exclusive humanism, this eminent frame where God has no place and people give him no time. How do you evangelize people like that? We're back at the doorstep that St. Francis de Sales found himself at when he went to the people of Geneva. But, but, because he asked himself that, what do we do? How do we possibly communicate with people that slam the door in our faces? How do we communicate? How do we get that gospel across? What is the message? Where is the heart? And we've dedicated it, just like the great doctor, just like the great doctor, St. Francis de Sales. We have dedicated our mission to love. We have dedicated our mission to love. We have dedicated our mission to prayer. We are following in the footsteps of great saints, of the popes, of the church, her tradition, her mass, the sacraments. We are following in those steps. And we're, and we're prioritizing, we're setting things straight because the modern world has got us all sort of you know, discombobulated. It's got us all sort of drunk on ourselves and our brands and our profile pictures. We go out there, we want the perfect angle. We want the perfect shot. All the while, we're giving people little snippets here, little snippets there and hoping that it comes together to create who we really are. And it doesn't work because why? Because of the wisdom of St. Augustine. Your heart is not going to find rest in social media. Your heart is not gonna find rest in sports. It's not gonna find rest in anything that you amuse yourself to death with in this modern world. It will not, because it only finds its rest in God. God is central. We take a knee every day for Christ the King. We press forward with that social dominion. Mm, optimistically prepared. If he comes, we're ready. If he doesn't, we're marching and we're laughing all the while. Ah, I love it. And I love all of you. All right, let's rock this out. By the way, in the comment section, there is some really ridiculous nonsense. <laughs> There's some ridiculous, ridiculous nonsense. Let's get that window capture in here. Let's get that window capture in here. Okay, right here. Uh, let's see here. Do, do, do. Right here. Oh, oh, first of all, first of all, Patty says, where does Jeremiah do all this stuff? Is it his own website? The praying and such. Telegram. Telegram, man. You have to go to Telegram. And, and, and look, I... <laughs> I don't mean to kind of like, you know, <laughs> puff myself up a little bit, but I truly in my heart of hearts believe that the, the Wolf Pack and Paleocrat Diaries, that we are on the forefront of something rather large, that people are sick and tired of getting stuck in news feeds that are curated. They're sick and tired of feeling that they can't say what they want to say for fear that they're going to get flagged for fear that they're going to get booted. And they're sick and tired, maybe, even of people who have these stories. They're like, yeah, I got, I got put in Facebook jail again for the 90th time. Well, get off of there, man. I mean, I get it in a way. There are some folks that that's where they're going to stay. If you feel like that's your apostolate that in your life, that that's your mission, that you should be engaged in that particular medium, then go at it. But I know very few people who've prayed and done some kind of like a novena or something and tried to discern talk to their spiritual director, and at the end of the day, the spiritual director was like, your apostolate and your mission are the unbelievers and the heretics and schismatics on Facebook. <laughs> I just don't believe that. I don't believe that. But if you're sick and tired of it, if you're sick and tired of all of the limits all the time that have that chilling effect on you, and, and have you felt it, by the way? Have you felt it where you want to post something, you see something, you're thinking an idea, right? You want to post it and then you delete it. Or you're afraid maybe that, well, maybe somebody like my grandma's watching <laughs> and my grandma might not like what I share. Or the Facebook, you know, the, the, the tranny brigade and the LGBTQ plus whatever thing else, you know, everything else brigade, that they're going to be really mad at what you post and maybe they're going to flag you and report you. And next thing you know, you're being restricted by Facebook. I've been restricted by Facebook and Facebook told me when they did it that I did nothing wrong. Think about that. I'm, I'm dead serious. Think about it. Think about the chilling effect of that. That people, they hear the story and they're like, dude, I mean, you know, um, I know a guy who got, 
in trouble and he couldn't even post live videos. And they said that he didn't do anything wrong. There was no infringement. There was no, there was nothing that he did. And they even thanked him for keeping Facebook a safe and friendly place. But I was restricted. So you don't even have to do anything wrong. Are you sick of that? Are you sick of getting stuck in comment sections where you post and, the, and basically the best that people give is a, a throwaway like that they scroll past it and like it. Half the time, if we're honest with ourselves, that like is only there to let the person know that we saw it. And maybe even just a fleeting moment, like, 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 just to keep, and, and sometimes, sometimes for that selfish ambition that says, if I like it, then they'll come and they'll check out my stuff. What a funky world that is. Are you sick of it already? It's so bad they're trying to rebrand. Are you sick of it already? Are you sick of going to websites where you go and, and all it is is a static page? You go and you can read what they say, but that's about it. There's no engagement. The comment sections always say zero. Are you sick of that? Do you want to be able to communicate with people in real time, just like you do in this thread, but that you're able to click on people's profile pictures and send them direct messages to share videos, to share pictures, to share links, to not be, never, never be afraid that you're going to get banned. Never. Unless you do something that's like overtly, violently illegal. That's it. But that you have the freedom to do what you want to do and that you're not ever going to look at a curated news feed. Never. Because the news, the only news feed you've got is a list of a bunch of different, in fact, look, I'll, I'll just show you real quick and, I, and then we're moving on because I, I could talk about this a long time. This is important to me. This is a big deal to me. Check this out, okay? Do you see this on the side? You see that? It says Paleocrat Diaries, MOC Guild Chat, right? The book club of the K9 Brigade, Paleocrat Diaries. Those are different channels or groups or um, conversations, right? Some of those are private conversations where it's got like four or five people in there. You can only access it by uh, a key, basically. You, you get invited to that by the admin. A group is anybody can join if it's public or private. So there's those. The Alpha Pack, that's the admin group. So all the admins involved with everything we do, uh, all the different extensions of the things we do, they all we communicate in there, okay? You got the Wolfpack prayer chain, all that stuff. Do you see the numbers by that? What that means is that there have been 13 comments, for example, on, at the book club, 13 since the last time I went in and checked. There have been two comments in there since I, I last checked the Wolfpack prayer chain, right? So you can go and you can see, and if I were to, if I were to pull up my, my, the, the ultimate list of things, anytime that somebody comments, if anybody right now, if anybody is on the Paleocrat Diaries Wolfpack chat, just, just start typing. You might be in the comment section, to be honest, right? You might be in the comment section, <laughs> and that's just the way that works. But if you're in the chat, just start typing, because here's the thing. When someone types, it says their name. And once they post, a little little bubble comes up with that, that new post you haven't seen. And if, if something below, let's say, let's say the Wolfpack Prayer Chain, somebody comments on that. And let's say all of a sudden the Wolfpack Prayer Chain pops up, right? That, and a new, a new post. The Wolfpack Prayer Chain will go up above Paleocrat Diaries Wolfpack Chat. So it's always just the, the most recent one is jumping to the top. But nothing is curated. You only see what you want to see and you only see it when you want to see it. That's it. And as I said, we have a prayer chain. Okay? We have a prayer chain. Oh, yeah. I, okay, yeah. I, I turned it off. That's why I couldn't see it because I turned off Telegram. That, that's just a static image. <laughs> I'm like, man, I'm like, that's, that's all? No, I don't even have, that's why I couldn't scroll. I was going to show you other things. But I'll just leave it at that. And so it's a free, it's a free app. There, there are things you got to do. But the thing is, we go ahead and we show that all the time. We, we help people with that. All right, check this out. Let's see here. Yeah, this is where it gets cuckoo. This is where it gets cuckoo. You would invite Yaki, a Nazi? Really? I don't believe it, Jeremiah. I said that I would invite people for a wide variety of reasons. Christopher Hitchens is on the list. So is, so is the, the, the drug addict guy who committed suicide named Hunter S. Thompson. <laughs> He's in there with other people. 
I would like to have a group in there where I'm not just sitting, look, I will have eternity, Lord willing, I'm striving for this, I'm aiming for this, to be in heaven, surrounded by saints, where we'll be able to talk to them, where we will be able to engage with them, okay? But there's also something, in fact, I think it was talked about actually on Monday's show, uh, on, on uh, Meaning of Catholic, I forget what show we were, we, we were on, where they were talking about, um, it, I think it was Tim Flanders, though. He's got a new book, by the way, so go check that out. Um, you know, that talking about how there, there are things that even the angels would be envious of and that angels can't do. And, and, and part of the unique, the unique situation that humans find themselves in is, in fact, not just that we're free, but that we're free and we learn from our mistakes, and that we're surrounded by people with all sorts of different ideas that aren't so close to the truth and we're grappling in different ways, which makes certain settings and situations so marvelous to experience, even when we're, when we're in the presence of people who may not agree with us. It's one of the reasons why I don't blush at the, at the, the idea that we have to engage with the others, that we have to go to the fringes. I don't mind that. I don't mind that at all. And you know, there's something to the fact that there were, there were great conversations that took place. Uh, in fact, some of their favorite conversations uh, between people like uh, Justice Scalia and Ginsburg, right? Or uh, Pat Buchanan and Hunter S. Thompson. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall for that. And I, I would be interested. The reason I want to talk to him is I want to find out how he wrote the book Imperium without any notes in that short of a period of time. And people can eat the meat and spit out the bone. They should do that with Oswald Spengler. They should. You know, people, people can look at different, different individuals in their lives and say, look, you know, otherwise we get into this mindset that's kind of this Protestanty thing that, that emerges whenever they talk about Christian music. And they're like, no, nah, man, you're only allowed to listen to Christian music. And you're like, that is such a scam. <laughs> it is. It's a scam. It's a scam put up by an industry, and I say that as someone who used to be involved, someone who used to be a journalist in the Christian music industry, the CCM, and the emerging Christian rock stuff, going to festivals and all that jazz. Christopher Hitchens was a sad puppet clown of Israel and Russia. He had weird sex parties. Oh my gosh! What do you think, I'm inviting him for that? <laughs> I mentioned before, I, I, I said, look, it would be great. Look, and this is the seriousness. This is where people, this is where people take themselves way too seriously. They do. This is a, if you had, if you had people you could invite to a 10 person dinner party there, you don't think that that would be amusing to have great saintly men and people who were not saints and have them in the exact same room to talk to each other, to debate, to slam their fists on the table, to cheers with beer. If not, you're a boring person. <laughs> what are you doing even watching my show? <laughs> what are you doing? I'm glad you're watching, you know. <laughs> I'm glad you're watching. But yeah, oh, Hitler and nine of his henchmen. <laughs> Man, as I said, there's some dumbness going on there. There is some El Stupido. El Stupido going on there. Hitler and nine of his henchmen. Yeah, yeah. So as I said, there is some there is some really dumb nonsense going on there. <laughs> What's going on? How's how's my how's my chat losing its mind right now? Yeah, Catherine Bishop, we need to get over ourselves. We ain't all that special. Jesus, Mary, Joseph, saints are special. Yes. Yeah, people need to get over themselves. Peter says, Jeremiah, are you broadcasting from your bedroom? Is, you think this is my bedroom? <laughs> it's my office, man. The last time this was a bedroom for anybody was when my daughter died in the exact place where I'm sitting. Her heart beat for the last time in the exact place that I have sat this chair. And I did it on purpose. That way, my mind and my heart are in that spot. Yeah. And thank you, Corey, for that distinction in there. I'm serious. I appreciate it, man. Yeah. yeah. And someone said Audrey Hepburn. So, okay. So yeah, they said it would be ferocious but fun. Yes, it would be ferocious but fun. It'd be it would be it would be enlivening. 
enlightening, entertaining. That's what, it, what do you think the whole 10 thing is, man? The, the world is not on the line with this. <laughs> the, the kingdom of heaven is not on the line with uh, who I'm inviting in the hypothetical uh, dinner party on a telegram chat. But there is a lot on the line with this, so we're going to begin. So Christian apologetics, right? We're talking a verbal defense or a speech in defense is a branch of Christian theology that defends Christianity against objections. Now, I, I make the case that we are living epistles and that in the modern era, the secular age that we are enduring, <laughs> I got to take these off. I make the, I make the claim that the modern world is uninterested in certain arguments, that certain arguments that once had force no longer have force because the social imaginaries of our modern times are different. And so you, it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. So much of apologetics treats it that way. It's not to say that the arguments of old are wrong or that they're not right anymore or that we've learned better. All of those things are foundationally true. It's about methods. It's about means. And you have to know who you're dancing with because you don't always bring that, par that partner to the dance. Sometimes God just, you know, plops you into existence. Like, you know, when you were born. <laughs> you were born. You didn't ask to be born who you were. You didn't ask to be born to the parents you were born to. You did not ask to be born in the time or the place that you were born into. You didn't ask to be born, for example, you know, when I was born, the night I was born, the number one song in America was Night Fever. That's pretty good. You know, that's not too bad. <laughs> right by the Bee Gees. So the Bee Gees, Night Fever, I can imagine myself jamming out to that as I'm coming out, right? I'm rocking it out to that Night Fever. But there are some people, there are some people that they were born um, in an era of, of big hair bands and where dudes are wearing spandex with poofy bouffants. And, you know, the Bee Gees kind of led up to that, <laughs> you know, they're part of that transition, so to speak. And now, you know, we're, we're definitely in transition land now. So the conditions on the ground change. And my contention is that we are at a place where we have to, I don't want to say hyperemphasize, but awfully close. <laughs> if there's a word, right, if there's a word for somebody that's, emphasizing but not hyper emphasizing i don't want to go ultra supernaturalist on this but to say we need to get back to that place where we are we are prioritizing with a great deal of dedication with a great deal of devotion and piety that we we re-emphasize the devout life that we re-emphasize the interior that we fall back to that place where where high cultures are formed where beauty arises where integrity arises, where sanctity arises, that on the golden brick road to perfection. We need to find our way back to that. And in doing so, in doing so, we will get out of that death loop that we've been in of saying, I can argue that person into the kingdom. Or I can give that person an otherwise reasonable argument and they are going to just say, well, that's, that makes perfect sense. That is, that is a, a rationalist scheme that has outlived its utility. This idea that people just, they, they're, they're otherwise going to make the right decisions. You just have to give them the right information. We know too many people right now doing crazy drugs. We know too many people right now on Tinder who are engaged in the sex industry, who are part of, you know, these... Uh, warlord jungle gangs, right, going around killing people in gangs. We know too many people who, who have heard the gospel and simply reject it. It's not about do, does the person simply need to have the right information to download into the system and become a Roman Catholic. That is garbage, especially now, because sin has riddled our civilization. We're already fractured. We're already on that part where civilizations are in decline, the life cycle of civilizations. They have a lifespan. It's, it's a freaky fantasy of people, right? A fun house of nonsense where they think, oh, it's just going to go on forever. Hulkamania is lasting forever. Yeah, man. 
We America. <laughs> that's the people that think the the Billy Graham styled Christianity is just that's going to last forever. That's baloney. That is baloney. You have to learn who you're dancing with. Let's see. So right here. This is a Bible verse that we, we're going to return back to every single time. Okay? In a word, think the same thoughts. This is uh, 1 Peter 3. Right? And, and everybody focuses on 15. And they focus on the second part. They, they focus on, if anyone asks you to give an account of the hope which you cherish, be ready at all times to answer for it. That's what they, you know, uh, I believe that's from the Knox, right? The Knox Bible. But people, they get, they get so focused. They get so focused on that part that when someone uh, asks you for a reason and they've infused the word reason, providing a reason to providing an argument, providing a syllogism, getting into a debate. I don't believe that that is what is meant there. I don't. And the reason why is because there's context. So listen to the context and you tell me if this is all about debate. If Paul is telling everybody that they need to go and they need to become professional online uh, click clacktivists debating the daylights out of people they don't even know. You tell me if that would be his advisement. Tell me. In a word... Think the same thoughts, all of you, and share the same feelings. Be lovers of the brethren. I would see you tender-hearted, modest, and humble. Let me, let me make this bigger. I want to I make the screen a little bit because I don't have my glasses. Sorry about that. Not repaying injury with injury or hard words with hard words. And think about it. Just think. How many times we've repaid injury with injury, especially in the day and age of social media? Just think about it. Be honest. Hard words with hard words. But blessing those who curse you. When is honestly the last time you did that? How often do you repay injury with injury, hard words with hard words, and you do not bless the person who curses you? This God's call demands of you it's not an option. It's not a preferred path. This is what God demands of you. And you will inherit a blessing in your turn. Yes, long life and prosperous days. Who would have these for the asking? My counsel is, keep thy tongue clear of harm and thy lips free from every treacherous word. Neglect the call of evil and rather do good. Let peace be. Be all thy quest and aim. On the upright, the Lord's eye ever looks favorably. His ears are open to their pleading. Perilous is the frown for the wrongdoers. And who is to do you wrong if only what is good inspires your ambitions? If, after all, you should have, you should have to suffer in the cause of right, yours is a blessed lot. Do not be afraid or disturbed at their threats. Enthrone Christ as Lord in your hearts. If anyone asks you to give an account of the hope which you cherish, be ready at all times to answer for it. But courteously and with due reverence. What matters is that you should have a clear conscience. So the defamers of your holy life in Christ will be disappointed in their calumny. It may be God's will that we should suffer for doing right. Again, for doing right or making a good argument. A good argument can be right, but this you're seeing the emphasis. Should make fun of you for, for uh, offering a syllogism? No. And by the way, boot Zen. Boot him. Look, I, I don't, I don't, you want to, you want to drag my daughter into it when she died and say, what would his daughter say of that? My daughter called me the Hercules <laughs> of talk radio. My daughter loved me. My daughter, I believe, I believe that I'm only a Catholic again because of her. 
Go fly a kite. I don't take kindly to that stuff. Actually, let's uh, let me let me rephrase that. Let me do an example of this, okay? Because I believe that what we're doing here is a just thing. I'm sorry you feel that way, man. I'm sorry that you're the kind of person who doesn't think that somebody can say El Stupido if they also believe in the creed. I think that there's a lot of saints, in fact, that you'd probably condemn. You'd probably think that St. Philip Neri might, in fact, be a really, really bad guy, and maybe the church was wrong to make him a saint. The guy was, was full of joy and laughter, merriment and mirth. He had it in words over his door. He wore pillows on his head, acting like they were a turban. John the 23rd was hilarious. St. John the 23rd, constantly making jokes. Constantly making jokes. In fact, it was a great, you know, great quote in the in the St. John Cantius talking about uh, talking about joy and laughter, merriment, and how it's so important to the Catholic faith. So if you can't say El Stupido, and you know, I don't know who you are. You sound honestly like a really grumpy person, and the kind of person that can know about someone's daughter in a, in a way that I brought it up, but it was it was in reference to the fact that she's been a big inspiration for what I do. And unlike you, I loved her. Unlike you, I actually knew her. So God bless you, bro. Don't boot him from the chat. Keep him in. Keep him in. Because the truth is, it's actually hard for me not to literally loathe people like Zen. But here I am reading this about injuries, hard words with hard words, and blessing those who curse you. So bless you, Zen. And I wish you the best. I wish you the best, man. But please forgive me as I kick the dust off my shoes for you. Right here. It was thus that Christ died as a ransom, paid once and for all on behalf of our sins. He, the innocent for us, the guilty, so as to present us in God's sight. In his moral nature, he was done to death, but endowed with fresh life in his spirit. And the idea being, of course, the idea that opposing beliefs, that that the function of apologetics is both to fortify the believer against personal doubts and to remove the intellectual stumbling blocks that inhibit the conversion of unbelievers. And so you got to look at it and say, you got to say, hey, you know, what is the primary purpose of this? It's to fortify you. It is. It's to fortify you. Yet so many people, when they study apologetics, it really is about winning a debate. And that's why I think people should at least begin to, to um, investigate their own lives. Do an examination of conscience and ask yourself, why are you reading so many books like this? Are you, why are you reading books about arguments? Why are you reading books about secularism and all these other things rather than reading books that are building you up in your faith? Why aren't you focusing on areas where you may have certain doubts and following in the footsteps of the faithful? Why aren't you doing that? But you have to have a right order. Saint Fran- uh, 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 Saint. <laughs> Father Lassance, he's a, he's, he is a should-be saint. Should-be saint, Father Francis Xavier Lassance, says, mark well what you have to do in order to accomplish the task of your life aright, in order to preserve the faith, which is your most precious treasure. So what do you have to do? What do you have to do? He says, religious instruction. First and foremost, the first thing, religious instruction. To high, uh, high, uh, you ought highly to prize the proclamation of divine truth by means of sermons and instructions of religious nature. I'm glad that there's a lot of people who tune in to Meaning of Catholic for that very reason. That's what we do, right? Some, some shows on here, it would be stuff that is, uh, stuff that would be not, not as full of jollity, right? It, would, it, would, it wouldn't be so, so uh, wild, so zany. It's more serious in its tone and temperament, right? That's fitting for certain people. I like there was a, a comment, somebody, somebody doesn't like the show. That happens. 
right? People like Jen, you know, people like that. But like, um, you know, the thing is, there are people who who don't like it, and they say, "Well, I, I tried," and this guy, he's like nails on a chalkboard. And somebody said, "You know, then then pray, and thank God that that He's provided this generation of people with a channel that provides for the needs of so many people that helps them out." There's a guy named Daniel. I wish I had the exact quote. It was good. But that's what we do here. We're talking about instructions of religious nature. Enthusiasm. We're covering things like secular age. We're covering things like Father Lassance, his manual for young and old men and women. Nor ought you ever to make use of a frivolous pretext to excuse yourself from, from attending them. So don't, you know, and it, you can make excuses not to watch the show. He's talking specifically here about things to do with instruction from homilies and stuff like that. But don't make a frivolous pretext. Don't make an excuse and say, oh, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm over here and I'm going to make an excuse. And really, the truth is you just want to hop on your, your iPhone or whatever. All right? Prioritize. Apply to yourself and not to others what you hear and seek to regulate your life accordingly. Make also a daily spiritual reading at home. And the second means is living up to the faith which you profess. So look at how they work in tandem. Look at how they flow. You say, okay, you, you, you um, read and you listen to sermons, to instructions of a religious nature, not just religious theme books, but instructions about it. Like this, for example, this is a great example of it. That you shouldn't make frivolous excuses not to do this, right? Because that, that leaves a whole bunch of room it leaves a whole bunch of room for people to to make excuses for things that would be like, you know, for example, um, amusing themselves to death. And that's not good. But more than all of that, you need to apply to yourself and not to others what you hear. It, I, I think that's wise, you know, like there's that one method of cleaning a house, man, uh, is uh, Cone Marie or something like that. So this method is kind of weird. It's a little bit weird on some stuff. But you go through different rooms and you, you, you touch everything and you say, okay, I'm holding this shirt. Do I really love this thing? Right? So you're not making excuses for, and love in the way that's not like, you know, I love the Lord, but things like maybe, um, you know, I, I actually need that. Right? I actually desire that, whether it's an heirloom, stuff like that. Um, so it's not just purely a matter of utility, because otherwise you're going to make excuses for the most torn up jeans in your closet, socks with you know holes in them and stuff, when you've got 30 pairs, shoes you don't need, stuff like that. So the idea is to, how do we, how do we minimize, how do we get it down to the basics, the things that we need, and getting rid of all the stuff that makes a mess, that just makes a mess of everything around us. It's kind of like that. You know, that we have to, we have to weed those things out. We have to look and say, what is it that we, what is it that we love? And in the book, in the book, she says, what do you do in a situation where you're wanting to clean your house, but you live with other people, right? And those other people are making a mess to take care of your own business, to do the best you can with what you've got, to recognize that it's going to take you a little bit longer because you're dealing with other people. But that if you do that and people see you doing that, that may, in fact, encourage them. And by experience has proven to encourage many people to begin being cleaner themselves. It's almost as if she read the book. <laughs> it's almost as if she read Father Lassance. Reg regulate your own life. Take care of your business. Be that example. Be that shining light in the room. Be the person, the guy, what is, it, what is his name? Um, Levy. What, what, what's his name? He was in the the TV show Chuck, right? He played the character of Chuck. Is it Isaac Levy? What, what's his name? Anyway, point is, you know, he used to be very a, a very devout guy. I think he was a Protestant guy, but he was a very devout person, and he was somebody that every day Jesus was just the thing for him, right? And he was in Hollywood. He's doing a major time show. And people asked him, you know, they would ask him all the time, why he's always smiling? Why is he always so happy all the time? And he pointed to God. They said, you know, you're different. I had that same experience when, when, I, when I 
had my Moravian experience, right? My conversion experience as a Protestant. When I when I went from being a homeless guy who had no no care whatsoever for God to all of a sudden being just sold out, just saying, "Look, I'm gonna I'm gonna pray every day for an hour or more. I'm gonna read my Bible, uh, twelve chapters a day for a year. I'm gonna do all this stuff." Right? When I when I made that decision, there were a lot of guys that I used to hang out with that saw the changes in me and saw how God had been changing my life, how prayer and how structuring my life around the Bible and prayer, how that had changed my life. And I had people, man, drug dealers calling me and asking, dude, what, like, what are you doing, man? Like, how, how, how are you this way? I remember a call with my buddy, my buddy, Caleb. He called me. It was like 10 o'clock at night. It was back in the day with the, before cell phones and stuff. Calls on the home phone. It's pretty late, right? Anyone old enough to know that would know calling at 10 or 10.30 at night, uh, you know, the family might be asleep, in fact. Netflix wasn't around yet. <laughs> Facebook wasn't around yet. See, people, people are going to bed at least at a more reasonable time, okay? And he called, and that's all he was interested in. It wasn't any of the arguments, wasn't any of the things I said. It was the joy in my life, the peace in my life, how everywhere I went, there was a kind of light about me that was just simply happy. It was joyful, genuinely joyful. And he wanted to know. It wasn't long after that he got baptized. I think that's something that we need to do. I do. I think that's something we need to do. Right here. The more blows a nail receives from the hammer, the more deeply it will be driven in. And you're going you're gonna to see Father Lassan say this kind of thing often, that when, when we're talking about our own lives, and you go, look, we, we are the, the wooden nails, right, that, that, that Christ is, is hammering away in us. He is the great carpenter. He is the one, his work in our lives. And we are, we are working out this salvation with fear and trembling. And the more blows a nail receives from the hammer, the more deeply it will be driven in. The more you, you begin to pray, and that's one of the reasons I love praying now every day over at the Wolfpack chat in the comments. I love doing it. E even yesterday, I did one, just a real quick thing. Somebody, somebody's a family member had, was just diagnosed with brain cancer and they'd fallen away from the faith. And he was really scared because there's going to be a big brain surgery. I know what that's like. My daughter had 17 hours. It's 24 hours that she was under anesthesia when I saw her. It was so traumatizing seeing her with the tubes and everything that the doctor looked at me and could tell right away, Jeremiah, you need to go home. Somebody needs to pick you up. Do you have anybody? You need to go home. You're, you are not here right now. And I immediately said, I got to pray for this person, you know? So I hopped on and we said, I said, look, we're going to pray right now. And we did, we prayed. But doing those kind of things and just getting more engaged in the idea of reading every day, of praying every day, of connecting frequently with my anchor and things like that, that doing those things, the more that I've done them, the more that I've realized that there are certain sins and habits in my life that while not maybe sinful, make me more susceptible to sin, that those things, now when those thoughts or those ideas or those activities come up, it's like there's something different about me in that place or in that moment or with that distraction or with that temptation. There's something different about me. And that's because of what he says. The more blows a nail receives from the hammer, the more deeply it's driven in. So do not be slothful in your performance of your religious duties. As soon as you grow careless in this respect, in the same proportion, in the same proportion, will your faith become weaker? and appear less convincing. And look at it again. The two, the two important things to him, the two important things when it comes to the apologetic method, because he talks about it, the two important things is that your faith is strong and that when your faith is strong, you appear strong. Why? Because we are living epistles. Because most people see things. And when they see things, they make snap judgments. It's kind of like, the the it was a an interview right with um with Marshall McLuhan and you can see it online he's it's kind of funky he's in this chair it's like back in the 60s so they had like 
the 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 chairs of the future that looked <laughs> they're kind of funny now you know like if you go in a house now and see them it's like oh man that's real vintage but back then that was like the chairs of the future and it had the little microphone on a wire that comes up and the the chair can kind of spin around and the room was dark and people were asking questions out of the blue and this one person says asked a question about the hippies and whether or not Marshall McLuhan was okay with the hippies having long hair and wearing whatever they wanted to wear and he said look I I don't want to be too strict on you know telling people you need to dress this way or that, that we all need to have the exact same style of clothes. He said, but they do need to understand that people in general, that we make these snap judgments of people based on what they appear, how they appear. And so if somebody sees an individual with long hair and tattoos all over and lip ring, they might think that person is in a rock band. That person might be a computer programmer. And a lot of people are thinking that too now, right? <laughs> They're thinking that. If you see a person walking around, you know, in a fancy suit, you might think he's a businessman. A person walking around with a collar. There's a reason why a priest wears a collar this way. Because people make those snap judgments. They can see you and spot you. It's why uniforms are the way they are. Because people make snap judgments. It's heuristic. Rapid action. They might be wrong, but that's generally how we work. And so the idea of how we appear to the world, it's not about a facade. It's an appearance that's from the heart. Because people would say, well, you, it, would, uh, it would weaker and appear less convincing. Well, oh, you just want it to appear that way. No, it's the same kind of appearance that St. Paul is talking about when saying that you need to be obedient and you need to work in, a, in an upright and righteous manner with your, with your uh, employers. Did he say so that you can be an eye pleaser? No. In fact, he specifically says not. But that, but by saying that, he's admitting that the, the employer is going to be pleased. His eyes will be pleased with what he sees. But what he doesn't see is the heart of the employee. And the heart of the employee is one that says, I'm doing this for Jesus. I'm doing this for God. I'm doing this for the advancement of the kingdom. The third means is inseparably connected with the foregoing. It is the avoidance of sin. Experience teaches that the decline of faith comes from below, proceeds from sin. The lower region of life, sensuality, and animal impulses. Be on your guard against them. Do not become their slave. Otherwise, your faith would stand in imminent peril. This is something that we need to be unashamed to talk about in the secular age. Secular people, right, in this secular era, the people, the exclusive humanism, the eminent frame of our modern world, they don't like to hear this. For one, it's because you are, it's, it is uh, the transcendent. It is, it is ideas from the transcendent that are, that are infiltrating their imminent frame that says there is no transcendent. This is all there is. The material that I touch, the stuff that I see or I hear or I smell or I taste, all of the senses, that's all that matters. There is no soul so when you talk about sin and you say the reason why you came to this conviction is not because you, you watched Cosmos. It's not because you think Neil deGrasse Tyson has the best mustache in the world. It's not because of any of that stuff. It's not because you read something by an unbeliever or because you went to the news and you were reading things about scandal. Scandal has always been. Schism has always been, scandal is from the very beginning of the church. We talked about it in enthusiasm in the part about the Corinthians. From the beginning. From the beginning. But the saints and saintly men and women throughout history, what do they say? What do they say? Experience teaches us this. And you know what? To be quite honest, I think I'd probably trust somebody who is, has an ear in the confessional. <laughs> I think I would. And say, well, you know, they've heard a lot. They've heard a lot of stuff, right? People coming up and talking to them. Sensuality and animal impulses. We see this right now with a certain somebody. And I, I, I don't normally name people. And I, it's okay if he's mad at me. And I'm really sorry if he is. But Steve Skojic. Steve Skojic needs your prayers. If you're listening to the show right now, I'm, I'm begging you, in fact, don't argue with him. Don't. 
Do not argue. Do not try to reason. Do not try to give the uh, the arguments you have and, and say, oh, well, maybe he doesn't know that what we believe about this or that. I can assure you, he does. I don't believe that it has anything to do with anything other, and this is where he might get mad, with this right here. With this right here. The decline of faith comes from below. It proceeds from sin. The lower region of life, sensuality and animal impulses, be on your guard against them. We pray for him at the wolf pack. If you want to, if you want to do something that actually helps him, if you want to do something and show you actually care and you're not going to make the matter worse, join the wolf pack chat. Don't, you don't even have to do that. I don't, I don't even want to be self-serving about that. Find the link. Find the link in the description of the Wolfpack chat that goes to the prayer. It might even be in the description below. Haley, in the, in the comments, please put it in there. Please put it in there. The link to the, the, to the prayer chain so that people can join. Because this is something that you just simply have to really leave up to God and say, you know, you're not going to argue him back. You know, and, and I don't, I don't know him personally. We, we haven't had necessarily the greatest interactions in the world. We've had bad ones. But I would remind him if I talked to him, I'd say, remember when we talked about getting off of Twitter and what Twitter does to people and the medium is the message. And you told me that you, you had read McLuhan in college, but it basically, you didn't understand a whole bunch of it. It's kind of gobbledygook to you. And I said, but it's a perfect example of what he was talking about. It wrecks people, man. It wrecks people. It causes extraordinary amounts of anxiety and frustration. And it's at the source of so many people who find themselves, because they, they find themselves in that environment, in the mess of that, that they find themselves more susceptible to doubt, more susceptible to various sins. And I'm sorry for being presumptuous, but you must understand, you must understand that I'm following in the wisdom of the church. You may disagree with them and we would have our disagreement, but I'm not, I'm not blazing my own trail and I, I don't want to do anything other than pray for you. And look at this, before all other means prayer, if you desire to keep your faith strong and lively. Right, he's talked about, I think we talked about that, about in the course of my long experience in the cure of souls, I've met many instances of the manner in which young men who came from thoroughly Catholic neighborhoods and pious families have later on, under the influence of irreligious and impious associations, been unable to keep straight, right? They've lost their faith. And with their loss of faith, they've shaken off all moral restraints. You, my dear young friend or old, will have to go out into life. You will find yourself in circumstances which are apt to imperil your faith. How important, therefore, it is that you should be made aware of your danger betimes and so be on your guard against it. He talks, he quotes uh, um, 2 Timothy, right? Talking about a, a day and age where people are heaping up to themselves teachers having itching ears that they will no longer endure sound doctrine we have to be on guard against this. We have to be better. You know, it's one of the things people can complain and say, well, dude, you know, in, in, in the, the stuff that you're trying to, to foster, right? The environment of stuff you're trying to foster for people who tune into the show and the community that's emerged from this, right? It's, it's, I'm, I've, people have said it's a movement. People have said it's a movement. Do you agree with that? Do you feel something deep in your bones about it? Is there something big where you feel like you're part of something pretty big and you don't know exactly why? Because sometimes that's how I feel. And it's not because, you know, I'm some, I'm some mastermind who's plotted and schemed and said, oh, if I do this or do that, all of a sudden we're going to have a bunch of people. Look, I'm howling at the sun. I'm a weirdo. I, you know, what kind of voodoo would that be? <laughs> you know, where am I getting that from? 
I'm making stupid jokes. Laughing at my own jokes. But do you feel that way? And, and the idea that in that place, you know, I had to have conversations with people to say, what do we do if somebody comes in and they're just antagonistic? They just want to debate and stuff. It's not meant for that. It's not meant for that. You can take that elsewhere. Because we will have to go out into the world. But I don't want it to be a place. I don't want it to be a place where people go, you know what? I was, I was scandalized. I was scandalized <laughs> over in this place. And so to, to just ensure the people, and that's why we have the centrality of prayer. That's why we read from the Bible. That's why we read from the imitation of, of Christ. That's why we read from these books. That's why we do the total consecration. That's why we pray the rosary and the, the little flower chaplet. That's why we do these things. Let's see. All right, if you follow it, it will surely injure you and lead you at least to the fire of hell at last. Therefore, be on your guard against the dangers to faith. And what are they? He said he's going to mention three of them. Be on guard against doubts of the faith. Doubts. Audrey Assad, she should probably read this. If such doubts present themselves, do not dwell upon them, but pray. Again, does he say, go find a book? Does he say that? Does he say, go find a book right now? Go, go watch a debate online. How does he say that we do this? He says that we are the best example, that our faith is what leads the way, that our, our faith as it is presented through our lives, that that is the apologetic for, the, for these times. If that's the case and we find ourselves doubting, what should we do? It's not bad to have a book, is it? No, but prioritize. What is the priority? Is it to fill your brain with the right information that's valuable and true, but is that the heart of the matter? Is that the central drive? No. What is prayer and how in all simplicity? Beyond that, with humility of heart. And he quotes right there, Oh my God, I believe this because thou hast said it, for thou art the eternal truth. We talk about the act of faith here. We talk about the act of faith. I've worn that part down. I've worn that part down in my, in my, my missile here. Listen to the simplicity of this. The church in her, in her great wisdom. In fact, let me say this. The act of contrition, I've said it before. The act of contrition is probably uh, apart from, apart from the Magnificat and apart from especially uh, the, the, our father and the Hail Mary, right? Those are like in a league of their own. Okay. Apart from that, I believe the act of contrition is one of the greatest prayers that's ever been written. I think it's one of the most, it's, it's so brilliant in the breakdown of it. It, it hits on, it hits on so many levels and layers, dynamics, degrees, all of this, all in that, that prayed from the heart, prayed with sincerity and true contrition. One of the greatest of all time. Act of faith. Think of the simplicity of this and think of the, the everyday Johnny Q and Sally Sue, the regular folks in the world, right? Not scholars, not geniuses. They're waking up early in the morning, another day, another dollar, elbow grease. They're going out, they're getting sweaty, they're getting tired. They understand the curse about having to sweat while you work. They understand that, the thorns and the briars of life. They understand they have to manage their time. They may not want to wake up, but they know that if they don't, that they're going to have to, uh, the, the piper will come piping and they might lose their home. And if they lose their home, where will the kids be? They got to do what they got to do and they got to keep on keeping on. So what does the church say? Oh my God, I firmly believe in one God in three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I believe in Jesus Christ, the true and only Son of God, who was born of the Virgin Mary and died on the cross for our salvation. I also believe, <laughs> I love how it just jumps. I also believe all the sacred truths the Catholic Church believes and teaches. That kind of sums it up, doesn't it? 
I believe all of it. <laughs> like, I, I'm going to be real specific about the Trinity. I'm going to be real specific about the Blessed Virgin Mary. And after that, just everything the Catholic Church teaches. They, they, were, they were thinking, man, how long is this list going to be? And someone had this genius idea. And then in the wisdom of the Holy Ghost leading the church into all truth, right? As the shepherd on this earth of souls, the great pastor here on earth, the foundation and pillar of truth to simply say, I also believe, <laughs> and by the way, BTW or FTR, for the record, I also believe all the sacred truths the Catholic Church believes and teaches because thou hast revealed them who canst neither deceive nor be deceived. As simple as that. And to take it to heart and to get over yourself and realize, look, <laughs> you, if you don't, you're in, the, you're in that place, that, that, that dimension, that weird, freaky, clown world dimension that we've talked about, where we say folks got verms on the brain and enthusiasm in their veins. It all comes down to you. You're the, you're the monkey coming down the mountain with some paper mache <laughs> that, you've, that you've written with a crayon on. Hey, everybody, check out the ideas I came up with. <laughs> Yeah. No thanks. No thanks, man. And yeah, man, Andrea, the 1938 prayer book. I knew you'd be proud of me, by the way. I now I knew you'd be proud. And you remembered that you remembered the year. It's true. And should these doubts continue to torment you, what happens though? People say, look, I've already done that. I've already done that. What do you say? Two answers. Number one, keep doing it. And while you keep doing it, right, mention in all confidence these things to your confessor, confessor or director. And you will receive good advice and instruction. Now, that's a little, someone could say, I don't know about that. To be honest, most of the time, most of the time, even in places you might say, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Like I've said it before. Some of these places that have, you know, masses where you got girl altar boys and nonsense. You go into confession over there. Some of those guys are way more hardcore than some of the tratty types. I I know. I used to be a set of a contest. Do you know how many three Hail Marys I got for doing crazy things? Crazy, wicked, bad things. And they're like, say two Hail Marys today. <laughs> you're like, what? I thought you guys were the rigorous ones. And you're like, dude, you ain't nearly as rigorous as, you know, Father Bob over there. At the Ordite Church. The one, you know, with the church that looks like it's waiting for a moon landing or something, you know. It's not like it's a space shuttle shape to it. But mention it. And trust that you'll receive good advice. In fact, pray that you will. Pray that in spite of whoever you got, and you should try to find a good director. But if these fresh doubts regarding matters of faith are suggested to you by unbelievers, what's the solution? of which you fail to see. So if, if they bring up something that causes doubt and you don't have an answer in that moment, answer simply, quote, I'm not able to explain this matter to your satisfaction. How often have you said that? And how often have you said that where when you said that, that gave you reason to doubt the truth of what you were saying? It shouldn't. You're not some know-it-all. <laughs> you don't need to be a know-it-all. Isn't that, isn't that just like evidence of something wicked bad inside of you? Isn't it? If you say, man, if I have to admit that I don't have the answer to this person, I don't know, I'm debating, and I don't have an answer in the moment, that man, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the church isn't real. As if it all came down to whatever you happen to have in your brain. Who made you feel that way? Is it pride? Is it a sense of self-importance that is not very accurate? <laughs> is it, is it a, a, an idea that you've got to win? And if you don't win, then maybe the truth of what you believe is wrong and not the mere fact that maybe you don't know how to present it. Or maybe that person is fancy clever. Like, for example, you know how many people, you know how many people sound super smart and yet if you boil down their beliefs, they say there's no such thing as right or wrong. But they want to convince you of that. And you say, is that true? 
There's no such thing as truth. There's no such thing as absolute truth. Is that absolutely true? Well, that is, yes. Well, then there is absolute truth, but it's only that one. Well, where'd you get that, Mr. Magic Man? You pull it out of a Cracker Jacks box? You pull it out of a fortune cookie? Cap and Crunch box? Where'd you find that? Nonsense. You can hear teachers and professors. I had one at school. Bless her heart. I actually care about her as a person. But a teacher, they, we were all talking in a self and community class. And, and the teacher brought up this idea, you know, like, what is truth kind of thing. And, and a student was like, there's no such thing as truth. What's ever true to you is true. And I'm like, what if I believe that that's not true? Well, you know, um, you know or, and, and the teacher's like, Jeremiah. And immediately it turned into this thing like, well, why does she have the right to say there's no such thing as truth? What's up with that? There's no such thing as right or wrong. And I said, look, if that's true, if that's true and there's no such thing as truth, number one, that's the stupidest sentence I've ever heard. Number one, even to explain and to ask the question, the very first clause of my sentence <laughs> is, is ridiculous. But I'm paying a bunch of money to go to the school. If the question is how many students are in this class and I write down, I count it all out and I say, there's 15 people. Let's just say, I say there's 15 people in this class. And someone goes, one billion. If you say that that person's wrong, you've immediately denied what you've just affirmed to be true and you've come against me for denying to be true. Look at the cuckoo pant nonsense going on here. This person has a doctorate. This person is a teacher at an otherwise highly respected journalism school in the Midwest. Well, liberal arts college that has a journalism school. What do you say? So sometimes you might be debating people and they sound super fancy, but at the base of it all, any position, any worldview that denies the existence of the Trinitarian God is toast on its own claims. You don't even have to worry about it. The moment they deny the Trinity, they already, already at the gate. They may not want to talk about it. None of them ever do. But the truth is they can't even account for the most basic thing and that would be the distinction of the one and the many. The thing that balances somehow in a great mystery. How do we have one, oneness, and manyness? How do we have, you're a person, I'm a person, we're both people. That we live in a world of symbols that you can understand and I can understand. That we can distinguish and yet find commonality. Compare and contrast. How do we do that? How do we recognize if someone says, go sit in the chair, and it's not the chair that I'm sitting in right now, that I still recognize that as a kind of chairness about the chair and say, oh, that's a chair. And that I can distinguish between that and a sofa. Those things are essential, in fact, to dividing and understanding things like object and subject. Those things are essential to understanding even words and communication, movement, time, all of those things. And to the unbeliever that does not believe in the Trinity, because the Trinity, it makes perfect sense of it because you say, well, yes, the created order reflects, reflects the Trinity. And the Trinity neither absorbs nor annihilates. They are one. And it's in three, one God, three persons. Yes. In the second place. Oh yeah, so so yeah, right here. So you should you should be able to you should just trust. If you can't answer somebody, just already know that the moment they deny the Trinity, their their worldview is already toast. These people, in fact, are stealing. And and they're stealing because they're created in the image of God. They bear the marks of the Trinity within them. They bear the these the image of this. Okay? And they live in a world. They live and move and have their being in a created order that reflects the God that made it. So it's like, it's like the code underlying everything they think and say and do. And yet there's freedom and there is sin. And that sin within otherwise free people, that original sin ends up causing them to prefer, even though they know it's true, even though deep inside their bones, they know it's true. 
They would rather exchange it for a lie. And they, they, they shroud this lie with all sorts of clever arguments, and in fact, more for themselves. Even, even they're, they're uh, going out and trying to evangelize you, to deconvert you. Even that is done in a wicked, sinful pride. And most of the time, purely for them, because it's insatiable. They want others to join them. They're unsatisfied to, to wreck their own lives. They must wreck all of those others with them because they've exchanged the truth for a lie. They've decided to worship the created order instead of the creator. Read Romans 1 again. And trust. Read the book of wisdom. Read the opening chapters in the book of wisdom again. And trust that you are okay, even when you don't have the answer. Because the church does. Do the act of faith. And point them to somebody who can help them. In the second place, avoid the society of those who speak against the faith and sneer at religion and sacraments and ceremonies. Break the conversation off abruptly. Have you ever done that, by the way? Have you ever been around people? Have you ever been around people that, that um, when, when you know, they, they start bashing the church and, and all this, how, how do you respond? Do you get nervous? Do you get, like, unsettled in that moment? Right? Because he says you should say things like, you know, that will do. Right? Let's, let's get this down so I can read the whole thing. But here we go. Right? That will do. Leave off talking this rubbish. <laughs> You can tell the era he's in. Leave off talking about this rubbish. You guys, you guys say, man, don't stop talking that, dude. You don't need to talk that way. And speak of something more sensible. Why don't you, why don't you talk about something that's not so dumb? We're modernizing it a little bit. Otherwise, people can drive to turn the conversation to some other topic after defending your faith in a quiet but resolute manner as well as you can. Isn't that saintly right there? Isn't that saintly? He who possesses a ready tongue can in certain circumstances such as these completely baffle the scoffer. But he, he says those people are rare. He says those folks are rare. Because this unbelief, which is a hell in itself and it leads to hell, is the fatal poison of modern society. And this poison is is, rep is presented under all sorts of different forms, especially in two, speech and writing. And he says, too often, the people that rail so loudly against Christianity know nothing about it at all. How true is that? How true is that? How true is it when you hear people who argue and they say, they say stuff like this, right? They say, oh, you say, that, you know, we, if we, we would have an infinite regress if we don't have an unmoved mover, if we don't have a God who wasn't creatable, who created God, man? <laughs> they don't even understand it. And they're the scientistic -y people. They're the ones who are super scientistic. -y and they're like, you know, they're the ones with the signs in front of their house. We in this house, which is, by the way, a total ripoff, a total ripoff of as for me and my house, right? That we serve the Lord. It's a ripoff of the Old Testament. It's a ripoff. What is it? Joshua. And they've just added this creed to it. Love is love. Love is love. And they've added this idea that they believe in science. They say, I believe in science. Science is true. And we, mo most Christian and Catholic people do not deny this. They deny your scientific mumbo jumbo. That's a different ball of wax, to be quite frank. But those people, they'll say the stupidest things. The most elementary mistakes. Well, who created God? <laughs> you are not getting the most fundamental. Right? This, is, this is like the stuff that you would learn in, in uh, uh, children's church <laughs> with the little felt boards. right? Those little felt paper felt things you stick them on and, and the teacher, you know, normally some... Susan or Kathy <laughs> moving it around. That's that level, man. But he says, be careful on your choice of books and magazines. 
terrible evils which result from the diffusion of books hostile to the faith and to the church. That is why people should do the exact same thing when it comes to when it comes to um, being online. They should. They have to. And by the way, this beer is absolutely marvelous. The Jasmine Spring from Tridentine Brewing Company. By the way, I love these guys. And they're over at the Wolfpack Chat. And so if you're over there, man, say hi to them. You know, and if, if people in the Wolfpack, if they're serious and they want to go down there, and they, if there's anybody around that area, it's, it's uh, about, I think, an hour away from Chicago, south. So I think it's about a four-hour drive. It's about a, you know, I think it's like a four-hour drive. And uh, to go down there, if somebody, if you're around that area and you want to meet up and stuff, it might be a fun time. We can coordinate that because it won't be till January. But people need to, people need to be careful about who they follow. They need to be careful. He said, it is to be wished that these corrupt persons would keep to themselves, <laughs> right? Talking about the unbeliever, right? It, it would be wished, right? We would wish that these folks would shut their yappers and say, look, it would be in your best interest to shut your mouth. It'd be in your best interest to zip uh, the lip. And maybe for a while, throw away the key and focus instead on mental prayer of the quiet. <laughs> it would be better for you. I, I believe I believe folks like Skojic need to throw away the key to social media and, and, and return to the quiet. Escape, man, get out. People who struggle with unbelief. I think Audrey Assad, same thing. They should, they should get rid of that stuff. They should walk away. Get down on their knees and pray. Frequent the sacraments as much as they can. Surround themselves exclusively, in fact, for a while, because they're obviously in a terrible, terrible state of danger. Let's see here. They're not content to do this but rush about like mad dogs, poison others with their bites. Most to be lamented, the plain people in our country districts are not spared. He's the Johnny Q. Sally Sue type of priest. One of the main reasons I love him. He, he, he is a priest of the people. And it's why we need to, if there's not already a cause for his sainthood, we got to start invoking him. <laughs> we got to start invoking those prayers, guys. Cry out for some miracles. We got to do it because he's got to be a saint. We got to be part of that push. I'm dead serious about it. I'm dead serious about it. This, this is a saintly, this is a saintly man. Can't you, can't you sense it? You've read enough of the saints, have you not? And if you haven't, you know, you need to get working on it. But, you know, and keep watching the show because we're going to do a lot of this. Lord willing, if I'm, if I'm doing this show till I'm old and gray, I want to say we've gone through a couple hundred books together. Some of the greatest books of all time. Nothing flash in a pan. Classics. People, their, their, their magnum opus that they left the world that desperately needed to hear what they had to say. But he is, he is a real priest of the people. That's why it resonates with us. But newspapers, periodicals, pamphlets, every household, we can now mention radio stations, TV programs, right? MP3s. We can now mention a whole variety of things, internet, right? Various groups, that you go in and it's just pouring out unbelief. We make excuses even to go and read the news. And it, it, there, there, are, there are times, right? And depending on your vocation in your life, there are times for you to really be familiar where you say, look, you know, I, if, if you're debating uh, nihilism, if you're debating uh, uh, atheism and you're debating the various strains or you're teaching about it, then it would be wise in fact to and it, it, not just wise but necessary for you to go and deal with that. If you're somebody who's a media person, you may need to to some extent rely on certain mediums. But I think Tim Flanders had it right. Tim Flanders used to say when he went on Twitter that he would pray before he went on. That he would literally pray and say, "God, this is a wicked place. This timeline, I know it's going to make me anxious. I know that there's going to be problems, and I'm asking, Lord, that you allow me to focus only on those things that I need to focus on. That is, that's wise, man. Don't you love Tim Flanders, by the way? 
He says that they talk about it all over the place, on public highways, in saloons, workshops, manufactories, by means of their irreligious conversations. And they use catchwords, forcible phrases. These he repeats whenever he finds himself in the company of others in order to lure them to destruction. It's totally true. It's totally true. It's bumper sticker. Jonathan Haidt talks about it in Righteous Mind. He talks about why, why people, especially, and this is true, especially of people on the left. It is true. And, and secularism, in its full-throated fashion, is more, is more prominent on the left. Right? It's not to say every single one is, is into the eminent frame that is into exclusive humanism, but they're on that spectrum. But the bumper sticker logic, it's why you can, you can almost bank on the idea <laughs> that if you see a car with a bazillion bumper stickers, it's more likely <laughs> that it's somebody who is a leftist. You can, you can do that. It's not, it's not foolproof, right? It's not a sure sign. A leftist or a libertarian, which is, you know, strange bedfellows, <laughs> strange bedfellows. You want to hear more about that? I'm going to be debating Kennedy Hall on the issue of classical liberalism on Monday. We're going to have, it's a friendly debate, a, a bro ha ha, is what we're calling it. It's a bro ha ha. And we're going to be debating that on Meaning of Catholics Morning Show, the Terror of Demons Morning Show, at 5 a.m. on Monday. So he says that there are whole shops that sell these. He goes and he talks about it. We, we all know, we know that people are trying to find amusement between their working hours. Therefore, they patronize these places where trashy periodicals and cheap books can be obtained. Well, now we don't even have to because all of that is in our pocket. All of that and more is in the supercomputer that we have in our pockets. The supercomputers, these. Two classes of books and periodicals are to be found uh, there to which we call our special attention to. The first one are novels, romances, Salacious love stories which awaken sensuality by means of objectable narratives. Okay? Now, so if you're, if you're reading Fifty Shades, he's probably talking about you. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious about that. If, if you're somebody who says, you know, I'm reading Playboy, but I'm reading it really for the articles. He's probably talking about you. <laughs> like, you need to be real. Be real about this, okay? Be real about it. And I'm not telling people, you know, people say America has EWTN and tons of upstart Catholic shows like this. Yeah, it's totally true. It's totally true. There's, there's enough media out there. At this point, there really is enough for the average Johnny Q and Sally Sue, whose job it is not to learn to debate masterfully against scholars, but to live their life as best as they can and to be familiar with debates so that they overcome their own doubts in their lives and to better perfect their own lives on that road of perfection, that road of salvation and perfection, as St. Alphonsus would call it, right? That there's enough out there for them that they don't need to embark too often on other things. And I think when they do, that they should, they should converse with people that that's what they do and say, look, hey, you know, what do you think about that? Should I, should I just go and watch this? Talk to your spiritual director. It's all the more reason for everyday folks to have a spiritual director. I think that is one of the driving things here. But, but don't make an excuse for the salacious things you see. These are subtle attacks. And listen, mingling with these stories, contemptuous expressions and subtle attacks in regard to virtue, faith, the church, and her servants. I think that that's true in so much of what we see on modern television. It's not always so overt in its anti-Christianity. It's not, it's not, it's the antichrist spirit that it has is not always plain as day for all to see. Sometimes it's, it's death by a thousand cuts, right? A thousand pricks. And then every once in a while, a huge jab, and then they fall back, right? So they come out swinging, then they fall back. And they do little, little bit by little bit by little bit, breaking the people down. 
And it's so subtle sometimes that most people don't even know it. In fact, they tuck it in most often with laughter. Because laughter helps for people to be opened up to what they're talking about. It's one of the reasons why I think that people are wrong when they say that every single time we talk about the faith, we've got to be deadly serious. You can be deadly serious and yet have the joy of the Lord in you at the same time. The second class belonged to the irreligious books, newspapers, and pamphlets, which openly and boldly blaspheme the church. He goes into, he talks about it, right? He talks about what those are. I, I don't think that most people, that an example of that would be like um, skeptical inquirer, right? That kind of thing. Free inquiry. I mean, those are just openly, openly against the faith, okay? But most aren't. Most don't make it so open. Most tuck it within other things. Like, like you know, was it the BBC that came out with the realistic picture of what Jesus would have looked like? It made him look like a caveman, to be quite frank. I don't mean to bust on the guy they got the, the model shot from. <laughs> you know, they're like, he look, would look like this. And you know, you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, so like the early iconic images we have that we attribute to people who actually knew him, you know, that's all foam balloons, right? He really looked like this guy over here. <laughs> Looking all sorts of rugged. Don't think so. Don't think so. He said the mind is brought into harmony with hopes. So if, if, you, if you are reading things that are uh, lovely, if you're reading things that are leading you on the path of salvation and perfection, if that's the kind of thing you are doing, like the introduction to the devout life, okay? Like the imitation of Christ, like, the, like every book I'm just talking about here, okay? In fact, all the books <laughs> that we're talking about right now on the Wolf Pack, every single one that we're talking about, uh, uh, every single one, total consecration, right? That's to bring harmony with the hopes that you have. How about this? Imitation of Christ brings you into harmony with the ideals of the writer. How about this? Right? Interior castle so that it's impossible afterward to be satisfied with low or ignoble things. How about the scripture? You know, the scripture that the horizon of the reader broadens uh, his point of view changes. The saint maker, <laughs> right? That the ideals are higher and nobler. His outlook on life is more elevated. And of course, the guides for young men and women. The missiles that we pray from. These provide us with great models, high ideals held constantly before the mind. The books we read in youth, make or mar our lives. Many a man has attributed his first start and all his after success in life to the books that he read in his youth. They opened him up to possibilities, indicated uh, his taste, and helped him to find his place in life. That's why this particular book is so essential. But bad books are a curse. They do a world of harm. Evil men, evil lives, evil examples spread a moral pestilence openly and powerfully. But nothing spreads falsehood and evil more surely and deeply than a bad book. We could add to that too. We could add movies. But I think even movies, this is a strange thing. It's about longevity. You could say, well, you know, so, so do, so do, uh, you know, BuzzFeed articles, <laughs> right? So do all of these terrible, ridiculous, nonsensical, evil uh, YouTube shows and things like that that are out there. Those spread falsehood. But a lot of those things are flashes in a pan. They're here today and gone tomorrow. The more that people begin to do a daily show that's not connected in some way to something bigger than themselves is the closer they get to being a flash in the pan here today and gone tomorrow. A book, however, as evidenced by some of those I've shown you just now, 
and as evidenced by Eric Ybarra showing me the 1977 edition of Enthusiasm that he has, or my 1938 edition of the Manual of Devotions has longevity. Yeah. He says, we cannot deny the immense power. It reaches many unwilling to read more serious books. We're talking about the novel. He says, the popular novel is to remove all thought of the claim of Almighty God to substitute humanity and philanthropy for religion and Christian charity and science for revealed truth. I think this is one of those things that you, you hear this complaint sometimes when people talk about um, when people talk about um, Harry Potter, for example. And I, I think that people don't like to apply that across the board to books that they may like that also do not have explicit references to Jesus, for example. Right? And they can, they can blend it and say, well, these, I believe, are the differences between, you know, Tolkien and the rest. Right? And that's a valid point. But talking about the story itself, Right? The story will outlive the author, to be honest. The author will speak in ways sometimes through the story, but the story itself, it, it kind of has a, a life of its own. And people will base things off of that story more than that particular person. Because it's a mix, too, of fiction. It's not just purely autobiographical. It's not just purely, it's not didactic in the purest sense of the word. It may teach things, but it's not, not as straightforward. But that doesn't mean that it's not a problem. There is a problem and, and, and there's a validity. And I, look, I'm one of those guys that says that I believe it's okay to read books that are not necessarily religious, just as I think it's okay to have paintings in your house that don't have a cross in them. I don't believe that every single song has to have some kind of religious word like grace or Jesus or the Blessed Virgin Mary. I don't believe that. I, I, in fact, I, I don't think it's very Catholic <laughs> to say this, to do that. You know, but at the same time, there is something to this argument that says, if I complain on Mondays on reason and theology, if I complain on Mondays that we live in a world with an eminent frame of exclusive humanism, that we just, that, that, that it's just exclusive humanism all around us. There's no, there's no reference to God. It's, it's, it's hidden it's suppressed, but in the wording of the narrative that they have embraced in their lives, there is no reference to God. It's wholly secular, atheistic, right, in practice, even if not in belief. They might say that they're agnostic or deistic, but in practice, as it fleshes itself out in time and space, it's atheistic, and there's no reference to d the divine. It's wholly secularized. And the idea is you can get your answers without the God hypothesis. That's the, the whole idea of I have no need for that hypothesis. He doesn't understand that he in fact does have need to even have the ability to have a hypothesis, <laughs> to even have logic or reasoning, inductive reasoning, to be able to put together mathematical formulations. You cannot do that without the Trinitarian God being a creature in a created order of the Trinitarian God. But in the narrative, in the narrative that people embrace and, and say, that applies to me. In that, it matters. He said that we should, we should be reading more Catholic books, that there's no limit to it, that there's tons of subject that would be useful to be well-informed. The grand and wide kingdom of the Holy Catholic faith. You, you could, you could say, I'm just going to read the books sold at a really cool traditional bookstore, and you would probably be able to do that your entire life, and you would never exhaust it, never. And you would, even if you read a bunch of different books on the same subject, like prayer or spirituality or devotion or apologetics or the Blessed Virgin Mary or dogmas of the faith, the history of the church. Even if you read multiple, you would never stop learning, ever. And you would be more rooted in your faith for doing so. And yet, so many of us really don't know much about that. I'm going to start putting together, if you guys know of Catholic uh, uh, different um, publishing houses, 
please incorporate that into the comment section below. And I mean, not, not, not in the live chat. You can put it in the live chat, but make sure that once this episode is over in like a minute, that when you do that, when you do that, that you, that you can go in the comment section and put a link in there with the description of the place and why you think it's a good place to buy books from. Encourage others to buy books that have helped you. Have you been somebody who doubted? Are you somebody right now who's doubting? First and foremost, pray. Second of all, find a religious director, right? A spiritual director in your life, a confessor, somebody that you can entrust yourself to and say, look, I, I need to talk about these things. Surround yourself with upright people who are also pursuing the faith, who are also embracing these things, the traditions and the truths of our fathers and their faith. Surround yourself with them. Read the books. And you can begin, of course, you can go right now. In the, in the description below this video right now is a Telegram channel. It's a free app. It's a Telegram channel with a bunch of people in it. In fact, I'm proud that the chat is now bigger than my channel. I'm proud of that because people are bonding together. People are praying for each other. People are building each other up. They're providing each other with beautiful images, right? Saying, look, here are great icons. Here are religious images. Here are great articles. Here are great videos and documentaries. Here are great PDFs. Here are great book suggestions. And here are prayer requests. And here's me praying for you. Let's join together right now because we're in this together and we got to keep on keeping on because we got to make it and we're not done. And there's a world out there that needs me and needs you, which means we've got to do the best that we can do. It's what we've got to do. It's what we've got to do. And that's what we do every single show here. We try our best. We try, we give it, we give it all we've got, right? To say, look, we're not perfect. We have, we have our doubts. We have our confusions in our lives. We have things that we do that are wrong, but we can make right on it. All you gotta do is say you're sorry. <laughs> All you gotta do is have a contrite heart. All you gotta do is get on your knees. Take a knee for Jesus Christ. Go to the confession. Do your penance. Amend your life and repeat over and over again until you die because we all will because all of us will it's true all of us will and so we need to be able we need to be able right to bond together to have a kind of fraternal connection right solidarity with each other and by the way in the comments patty asking about uh body and art and stuff there's, I shared a video recently about it. I have certain views as an artist, uh, but go check it out over at the Wolfpack. I know that you saw the link. If I don't see you over there, Patty, I'm gonna get upset. You're in this live chat. I wanna see you over there, bud. You gotta do it. But join together. It doesn't matter if you're on the Wolfpack chat or not. I mean, it's cool if you're there. We'd love to see you. But even if you're not, find those people in your life, in real life, that are there for you to, to lift you up. To lift you up. Make sure to go to that Saint Maker, saintmaker.com slash Pillarcrat Diaries. It helps, right? Even just going there, even if you decide not to buy it, just being there really does help, to be really honest. <sighs> We're grateful for all of you. And as we say at the end of every show, with all of our heart, never give up, keep on smiling, and momento mori. I want to make people dream bigger thoughts.